Welcome to the Richie Flow Nutrition Podcast. My name is Cameron Borg. On this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Veda Austin. Veda is a New Zealand-based water researcher, public speaker, mother, artist, and author. She has dedicated the last eight years of her life observing and photographing the life of water. She believes that water is fluid intelligence, observing itself through every living organism on the planet and in the universe. Her primary area of focus is photographing water in its state of creation, this space between liquid and ice. It is through her remarkable crystallographic photos that water reveals its awareness of not only creation, but thought and intention through imagery. Veda has spoken at the International Water Conference 2022 and is currently collaborating with various scientists and researchers throughout the world on the nature of water and its receptivity to consciousness. She is highly regarded throughout the community for her contributions to the field. Her work is an inspiration to all who do not have a specific scientific background but observe the intricacies of nature. I've been following Veda's work for quite a while now and she's continually inspired me with her dedication to bring this knowledge to a broader audience. Her passion for water has led her down the path of a true scientist. She is conducting no-cost experiments that have potentially massive implications in the world of biology and chemistry and can be performed by anyone. I deeply admire what she's doing as I think it brings us closer to what science really is, observing and attempting to understand and align ourselves with nature. During our conversation, Veda shared some images of her crystallographic work, so I would encourage you to watch that section of this podcast on YouTube or go and see her Instagram account at VedaAustin underscore water. I'm really excited to release this podcast, so with all that being said, I hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you so much for coming to speak with me today, Veda. You've been someone I've wanted to uh, talk to for a really long time. Um, I've been following you for a while, obviously, um, you know, I've spoken to Jerry Pollock, who is a big fan of yours. And uh, I really think that what you're doing um, at the moment is one of the most important things um, that's being done in science. And uh, it's great because you're not sort of inside, um, you know, you're not you're not this PhD who's got a lab, you're just doing this, um, you know, in your own home, which I think is uh, such an awesome thing. And you've taken it to the um, to the world, which is, uh, fantastic. So, um, I'd love to know, um, when you meet someone for the first time, how do you describe to them what, what it is that you do? (laughs) That's such a good question. Nobody's actually asked me it that way before. I actually, somebody did do that the other day. They said, Oh, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a water crystallographer. Essentially I take photographs of water in a particular state of freezing, Um, after it's been inspired by something previously. And what I've identified in the over 37,000 photos I've taken of water responding rather than reacting uh, to human consciousness is that water is able to use its building blocks of ice to design imagery that's relative to the previous influence. So... Simply, uh, maybe I think of a hand, uh, project the thought of water, of of my hand into the water, freeze it using my technique, and potentially see a hand in the ice. And I think one of the things that people sometimes kind of immediately think is, oh, maybe she's just kind of like, you know, trying to see, is it really look like a hand or does it really look like a tree? Is it one kind of some kind of abstract thing? But actually, and you mentioned Dr. Gerald Pollack, who's a friend and mentor of mine. Obviously, I'm also a huge fan of his. Uh, And he gave me a great suggestion uh, some years ago because he's he's known about my work for longer than most people. And uh, and he said, why don't you put together uh, a questionnaire and show it, uh, get it out there on the social media and basically have 25 of your photos of ice. And for each photo, say, what does this picture look like to you? So I sent it out through um, other people. So no one knew it was coming from me. No one knew what they were even looking at. They didn't know they were looking at ice. And the question wasn't leading. It just said, what does this picture look like to you? And twenty uh, out of those 25 images, there were sorry, there were uh, 298 people that did the survey. And um, out of those 25 images, um, there were 
three of them where 100% of people recognized the image in the ice for the influence it was. And across the board, 85% of people were able to identify that the image they saw in the in the ice that they didn't even know was looking what they were looking at looked like the um, the thing that influenced it in the first place. So statistically, that's pretty impressive. Um, if you were going to rate water as as an artist at the at the age level of what we might have as humans, uh, it would be up in the range of of a sixteen year old, fifteen, sixteen year old. Um, so it's pretty amazing, really, what we're seeing. Uh, but I've identified something interesting that water communicates using this method. And, and people might be like, what do you mean it communicates? Like, even that's like crazy, right? To a lot of people, unless you've been studying water a long time. And even then, that might be pushing the boundaries. And I fully appreciate that. And as you mentioned, you know, I'm free to do this in my kitchen and I am not uh, under any limitations of um of a lab and not to say that that's a limitation but they tend to do things in a very specific way of which i fully appreciate i think there is it's important the science is important the art is important and i also believe that intuition is important and i think there's a threefold that gives you a very big picture when you're only looking in one direction you miss a lot of other things so by doing it this way i i feel it's very um very good and other people all around the world are doing it because my technique is is really, um, you know, catching fire, if you will. And hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people now are sharing their images with me after learning how to do this technique in their kitchen too. But I've discovered that water shares information in three ways. Uh, the first I would say is called signature patterns. It's very simple, really. Um, tap water from a municipal tap water tends to have a very disordered kind of signature pattern. Uh, rain water tends to look like a fanning pattern with a slight curve at the top. Uh, spring water taken directly from a source uh, forms these things that I call star hexagons that look like uh, a star that crosses and they have little ferns coming off each leg and they form the shape of a hexagon. Uh, filtered water tends to form lines that are kind of compacted together that make it look a lot like a filter. So these are what we call the signature patterns of water. Interestingly, people also have signature patterns that I've never discussed about before. Uh, but I started discovering this some years ago in the earlier part of when I started doing this work, which has been now coming close to 10 years. And uh, a friend would come over and I would get my friend to drink some water and leave me some. And then I would freeze that water. And each time that person drank from that water, I would always see a particular pattern in the ice different from when anyone else drank water. And it was this kind of a square box with a cross inside. And that was that person's signature pattern. So it's very interesting when you start seeing that that actually maybe even we have a signature pattern in ice that, 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 what does that mean? You know, there's a lot of room for exploration there. But exploring the concept and idea that water can communicate is a, is a very interesting one. And, 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 and I would say very controversial. Um, and I think that it's extremely difficult for, um, for people to uh, even imagine, unless you're coming from a, a, an indigenous perspective or a very open-minded or potentially I'm going to ancient perspective, that um, that water is a life force energy that can communicate. I don't usually tell people the really long version like that, <laughs> but um, but it usually gets into some pretty uh, interesting conversations. Oh, I can imagine absolutely, and. You know, I think the more I've looked into this, the more it, the more it makes sense to me. You know, having having uh, you know followed the work of um, Gerald Pollock and even the work that Rupert Sheldrake's doing um, on the forms that appear in water under certain conditions. Um, you know, the more I look into it, the more it sort of makes sense, and and you can see that these things are quite repeatable. As you said, there are patterns that occur not just once it's not just a one-off you know these are very repeatable 
Um, and, you know, when something is repeatable at that level, you know, we need to start taking them a little bit more seriously, even if we don't understand why. Um, mm. That's why we need to take them more seriously. So um, when did you first do, when did you first start doing this um, and crystallizing water and, and recognizing that it was forming certain patterns? I started doing this nearly 10 years ago, but I will just quickly jump over to something you just said. Mm -hmm. So I said that it communicates in three ways, and I only said one. The signature pattern, patterns are one. The other one is what I call is art. I always say that art is the heart of water, and art is the mostly how people know me from the way in which water has been designing pictures that are very recognizable. The third way of which I'm getting more scientists interested is the area of repeatability. And it's interesting how we kind of have this desire to see things repeat, to take it seriously, right? And I find that kind of interesting. Um, but then, you know, I'm very interested in seeing patterns of things. That's one of the gifts that I have is to really observe things for long periods of time and, and notice their patterns and commonalities and things. So um, I call that area hydroglyphs. So that is something essentially which is a symbol in ice that I have identified and repeated at least 50 times using a word influence. So I say in my own words that uh, water doesn't read words. I mean, that, that you know, people might think, oh, this... That, that on its own, it's it's kind of crazy talk. But what I would say water does absorb the energy of words, which is a really interesting idea. So when it crystallizes, what it's crystallizing into is the energy of a word personified. It's a very interesting idea. It's actually a 3D emotional language that is being presented here. So... Um, I call it emotional because of the way that we read them. So bringing it back to say that I have one hydroglyph, I have to have used a word. By using a word, I write a word. I put my Petri dish of water on top of it for 30 seconds. It's a bit of an, a, a, a protocol that I use. 30 seconds is not too long and not too short. And uh, freeze it using my short-term method of crystallography, which takes approximately five minutes and then photograph them. Now, there should to say I have a hydroglyph, I need to have seen the same symbol in the ice appear from that word at least 50 times. And I don't do them time after time after time on the same day. I actually stretch them out over time. I think that that way you can't say, well, the, the energy of that was still in the Petri dish and it's just copying it and all this kind of thing that people would rightly be saying. So I've done it over long periods of time. Um, so it's very interesting and compelling when you see, for example, at the last water conference where I spoke, I gave 64 examples of each hydroglyph. When you see them like that and you see how they look and you can identify them, it's like, okay, there's something here. What, what are we seeing? How is this working? You know, so uh, my job really is to present the work and then for science to figure out how it's happening. Um, because I do not have all the answers, but I do have a lot of ideas around it, stemming from a, a number of interests of mine. One is water science, uh, but also from a, an indigenous um, holistic perspective, uh, intuitively, artistically. I think there's a lot to um, learn here, and I've spent a lot of time observing. So um, the First time this ever happened for me and what got me really into it um, was when I was reading, there were well, there were three people that kind of uh, inspired me, all pioneers in their own way. Um, so most people uh, were impacted in one way or another by Masaru Emoto's work. The science community did not embrace him because he openly shared that he cherry picked his photos to, to display what he was trying to say, that water was able to store and share information um, and was sensitive to thoughts and words. And his work was seen very much in contrast, like love and hate, 
um, and and uh, heavy metal uh, versus classical music. So as humans, we tend to love to see extremes. I've noticed that when on the on the odd occasion when I share an extreme picture, um, people love to share it. It's like we love to see the best and worst of things, but so much of our real life is all kind of in between. And there's lots and lots of shades of gray. And so I'm very interested in those shades of gray. And I always say the secrets are in the subtleties. So when what Emoto did though was open the door for people to really see themselves as sensitive bodies of water, as I'm sure your listeners know and you, that by molecular count, not by volume, we're 99% water. And there are more water molecules in our body than stars in the Milky Way. So when you put that into perspective, you know, that it kind of really makes us go, oh, right. You know, even our eye lens is 99% water. We see the entire world through the lens of water. And we don't really think about it. Uh, when we cut ourselves, we leak. When we're emotional at certain times, we leak. Uh, when we sweat, you know, when we exercise, we leak. We go to the bathroom, we leak. We leak in all different kinds of ways, and yet we still think we're so solid. Um, so it's an interesting one. And then the um, the second person was lesser known. His name is Laurent Costa. Laurent has become a friend of mine. He's a French microscopic photographer and does work much like Emoto did microscopically. But he never wanted to experiment on water. And, and you're really like, I, I, I don't say the word that I experiment on water. I don't like the idea of experimenting on something that I'm having um, conversations with. And so there for him, he felt that water was his spiritual teacher. And I feel very much the same way. In fact, I feel like I have many different relationships actually with water. But uh, so he didn't want to experiment, but he wanted to inspire somehow. So sometimes he would smile at the water before he flash froze it and take photos of it microscopically. And what was amazing about his work is that under the microscope, he was seeing happy faces he was seeing responses back at his smile that were pictures. He was seeing hearts. He was seeing fish that were all relative to something that had happened in his day. And when I saw the pictures, I'm like, wow, they are amazing. And because I worked professionally as an oil painter for 15 years, I'm also a researcher, but but I, I love art. So I do see the world artistically. So for me, to see something other than geometries actually was very significant. Uh, the third person was a man by the name of Thomas Hieronymus, and he was a radionic engineer. And he made an interesting observation when he went into a Parisian meat market on a very cold day. He noticed that the freshly placed organs of an animal appeared to be affecting the way the frost froze on the glass behind where they were placed. For example, the, the frost would freeze into the shape of a liver organ above a liver organ and so on and so forth. And his hypothesis that there seemed to be some kind of life force energy still emanating out of these organs um, because there was water in the blood. And each organ has something called um, a sonic signature. It's kind of like a cymatic imprint of the organ in the water that's in the blood. And he thought that the water in the organ was sharing that information with the water in the air, which was extremely cold and froze into this blueprint shape which I found fascinating, but also um, encouraging because he was seeing it with his naked eye. Even Rudolf Steiner suggests to his students to notice the patterns that form on the, on the window of a butcher's uh, shop compared to that of a florist's and see how different they are. So I wanted to see if water really could store information myself, because it's one thing reading about it and have, seeing other people's experiences and things, but it's a whole other ball game when you do something yourself. So uh, I had a Petri dish, a glass Petri dish from another project I was doing at the time. And I had some spring water that I'd had a healing experience with. Um, just so people know, I don't only use spring water. I've used many, many, many different types of waters. So, um, so just getting that out there because I often forget to mention it. Uh, and so I was holding my glass dish and I knew that the secret was in the freezing. All the examples of people I just gave you what was so interesting is that their discoveries were when when uh, the unseen had become seen, where liquid has become a liquid crystal. 
So I was like, oh, okay. So I'm like holding my dish with water and I thought I'd project a thought into the water. And as I was thinking about what I was going to think about, there was a little bit of fluff I saw floating in the water. I'm like, oh my God. So I put my hand in to take out the bluff, consciously thinking, I wonder if my hand will have any impact on the water's memory because I didn't know if it was a real thing. So I put it into the freezer with the peas and the broccoli and all that and forgot about it. It had no attachment to an outcome and no idea if I'd see anything. Um, and then a few hours later, I came back. I took it out, held it up to the light and took the first photo that has launched all these thousands of photos. The Petri dish is essentially the size of my hand roundabout. It's 10 centimeters in diameter, so it's quite big. And the hand ice in the ice image um, that I saw took up half of the Petri dish. So that's macroscopically huge. And the, the, the imprint of this hand that I saw was so undeniably a hand. It looks like an x-ray of a hand, and I'll show you in a minute. Um, but I, I was like questioning myself. I'm like, can this even be real? And I showed my son and I said, Rama, does, what does this look like to you? He had no idea what I'd just done. He just looked at me. He said, it's kind of like a creepy hand, mama. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it really is. And um, and then I thought, well, if any water is going to be naturally informed, it would be the ocean. So I got some seawater and froze a thin layer of that and was nervous before I took it out because I'm like, if I see something relative to the ocean here, then maybe this isn't just some random thing. And I saw this amazing fish with this perfectly round eye and gills and a fin and tail and all of this. And really that's when I was obsessed with doing this work, with using all kinds of influences prior to freezing, from photographs to music to thoughts to, to you name it. Um, but for that whole year, I completely froze water solid and I didn't know any different. During that year, I started to learn a lot more about the new science of water and the fourth phase of water. And I and I remember Jerry Pollack talking about how at the fourth phase of water, where it, it starts to build exclusion zone, is as water is beginning to freeze and as it's beginning to melt. And I began to become curious as to what was really going on in the freezer, because my freezer wasn't see-through, and I couldn't see how it was freezing and what stage did it freeze at. So I started to open my freezer earlier and earlier and earlier to see what was going on in there. And after about five minute time, uh, there was, I noticed that there was some liquid still on the top of the surface, but there was ice underneath it. So I was curious and I'm like, oh, I, I wonder what that ice looks like. Like what, what ha what's happening here? So I took it out and I tipped it and the, the liquid just drained away. And I was left with the most incredible crystallography of which is the technique that I use today. Each freezer setting is different and all these kinds of things. But once you know how to do it and what you're looking for, it's very simple. And it allows a lot of light through. It's only about two or three millimeters thick of ice. But the amount of detail in that ice is phenomenal. So I look back at my work uh, at my work that I began with when I did the hand and I'm amazed that I got such clear imagery given that it was frozen solid and after seeing how water freezes which some people might think it's like watching paint dry but I think it's amazing um, I've observed that it freezes kind of in three layers the first layer then the second layer it's like it builds a scaffolding and then there's a top layer and in between there's liquid and eventually that freezes and when you watch it um, freeze and we have I have an example of actually uh, fast forward just kind of like um, watching the different stages and why I now use the stage it's a very interesting little video that somebody who learned my technique um, was able to capture in the freezer by using some kind of um, special camera so I, I like sharing that because people can see you know where that's why that stage is important I call this stage the stage of creation. So before I start talking about the importance of light, and I think that this is this is something fascinating, that when I shared at the annual water conference in October to a bunch of scientists and physicists and biologists, it was, it was something an Indigenous woman, American Indian woman, told me about 
speaking to bees. And actually what she shared, she had so much, pardon the pun, light on what was going on with this work um, that everybody was really gained something from from that wisdom, which I'll, I'll share after I share a few photos, if you like. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before we before we start sharing the photos, I would love to ask, and this has just come to my mind now, um, mm-hmm. do you think that the the patterns that come out um, in these petri dishes when you're doing the crystallography are they? And I'm going to, I guess, anthropomorphize here. Are they purposeful on the part of the water? Is the water trying to do that, or is it some some sort of epiphenomenon? It's sort of happening you know, unconsciously, I guess. What, what, what do you think is, is going on? Is the water actually trying to communicate or is it just uh, like, like um, the common thought of consciousness is with us, it's just an epiphenomenon. It's kind of an accident that it happened. I don't really think there's any accidents. Um, I also think that you can use a lot of different words to explain the same thing. I think phenomena um, is also something of which you could say it's it, you know it, that water is showing that it, there's this unusual phenomena happening that it's designing in a seemingly intelligent way mm-hmm. but at the same time um seemingly is it seemingly or is it intelligent mm. i mean and how do you define intelligence i think what we tend to do as humans is define intelligence using this kind of human yardstick But if you look at mycelium and you see this incredible intelligent network of information exchange, uh, if you just look at um, the intricacies of how cicadas make sound and how they interact with the trees, if you just like look at nature, each and every single thing in nature has an intelligence, has an ability to do something that we can't necessarily do. Even dogs and cats, they can see and hear things that we can't. Does it mean that those things are not there? Well, I don't know. So I think there's a lot of questions about that. Personally, in my opinion, I think that water um, is definitely sharing um, and communicating intelligently. And I don't think that it needs to be within a body to do that. The point is, is that if you really look at the fact that we are, by molecular count, 99% water, and if you really, pardon the pun, boil it down, we are water consciousness minerals and salt. Salt is amazing too, because you put salt um, into water and it disappears. If there's only a small amount, you'll never know it was even there. But on a large scale, obviously, you'll taste it. But when the um, water evaporates, the salt is still there. When somebody is cremated, the ashes are actually salts that remain. Again, the salt and water in synergy become this kind of liquid crystal because crystals are are salt. Salts are crystals. And we use crystals in all our technology to store information. I think they play a very big role together. Um, And then we get into some much deeper concepts, I think, when we get into this idea and topic of water actually communicating with an intention, with some sophistication, uh, because in our minds and in our reality and many people's reality, we're in a very confined, we're confined to the physical realm because we're in a physical body mm-hmm. until we dream or until we have some kind of out-of-body experience from various different ways in which we might do that. Or maybe we have uh, a, a near-death experience And then suddenly we realize that something else is going on Mm. outside or inside the body. You know how it means. So it's a very interesting kind of idea that what is it then that is around consciousness? We can't define consciousness as of yet other than we have some observability to observe ourselves. But how do we observe ourselves it's very interesting. I'd love to get into that idea of the observation because I think that there are two types of water. I think there is physical water and spiritual water, if you want to call it that. Maybe you'd rather call it intuitive water or conscious water or something else, but whatever you feel comfortable with, it's kind of, again, lots of words we use to say the same thing. But um, in in Maori language, the word for spirit is wairua. That means two waters, the the physical and spiritual it's much more deep than that but it's right. a basic um 
And I think that the fact that we can observe ourselves from various different perspectives and that that observation is not coming from a, a sense touch or taste or hearing or, or any of those regular senses that we experience the world in, the observation is coming from, um, from something else, something that's a little bit more intangible. And so how is that? Well, you consider that water is not just a liquid that we mostly think about it as, and it's not always a, an ice, and it's it's also um, you know, it's a, but it's also a gas, and we've we've also understand that it's kind of a plasma or gel, you know, in this fourth phase of water. But we know so little about water; we literally just know a, maybe a drop in the ocean as what we actually know about water. We can't even 100% become conclusive as to where it came from. You know, some science says, yes, it came from asteroids or meteorites. Some say it came from within the Earth's mantle, like primary water, and, and nobody can fully agree on the topic. It's like, well, okay, some people think that there was a fog that covered the Earth in the beginning, and eventually the fog, um, you know, became the the land mass, the, the uh, water masses. Who knows, really? We We clearly don't. Nobody can agree. We can have educated guesses, but I think what we're doing is having a lot of educated guesses about things we don't really understand. Mm. And if we don't understand even the origins of water, how do we understand ourselves? There's a big question. It's like we're told we're so carbon, but we're so much water. Water is like the part of us that is emotional. Water is the sensitive part of us that is um, that I think personally uh, is connected interacted, intertwined, perhaps the same, I don't know, with spirit. I think that if you look at consciousness and you look at water separately, you can go great big talks about both. When you put them together, a lot of things start to make sense. And I think that because we know so little about these stages of water, for example, most a lot of people don't realize that there are something like 300 different types of ice and each of those types of ice has very specific details of, and phenomena about it. So you think about that and you think, oh, my God, then that opens up all these new subtleties to know just about one of those little bits of ice. So then you think about all the other areas that we haven't explored around water. And it's interesting because I've had conversations to pe with people who have had near-death experiences, and they all say they have the sense of rising. Well, that's exactly what a gas does. And when a gas rises, expands, it also cools, which is probably one of the reasons people feel spirit as cold. So it's a very interesting idea. The perhaps this this it is a perhaps, of course, that the idea of the soul, the spirit, the subtle body, consciousness is able to leave the physical body, uh, observe the physical body. So one of the characteristics that all of those people had is that when they looked down upon their physical body being resuscitated, three of them said the same thing. Three of them said they looked upon their body and they thought, I hope that person's going to be okay. They had no attachment anymore to that physical body. And so that is a wonderful example of the observer, of the witness, that I think that water actually is. And I think that it's one of the ways in which the the um the silver thread if you will that enables this consciousness to enter and leave and move because we observe ourselves even in the dream time of course is electrical charge um electrical charge is important because of course heart math can reach how much our electrical charge is it's a very real thing it's not crazy or woo woo um but we're also in an ocean of water around us in the air, the fact that we breathe means there's water coming out um, of us, but we just don't see it. Does it mean it's not there? Of course not. Mm. So within that, that some of that water is attracted to the electrical charge, enabling us to have a kind of web of energy or information that is both absorbing information like a liquid antenna and also putting information out about ourselves. And, this electrical charge, I believe, is one of the ways in which people can come back into their physical body after they've been, their heart even has stopped beating for, in one case, 25 minutes with one of the people I interviewed. Um, 
it's very interesting. I know you were on my last masterclass and Jerry Pollack discussed something I thought was quite novel. You know, he said that um, one of his students uh, was doing a study on chicks, on, on um, chicken embryos as they were starting to form, which you can, um, you can grow them without them being in the egg. So you can see their state of development and they stopped the heart beating at three or four days. They wanted to see if the exclusion zone levels would, would just drop flat with the, all the other vital signs. And what they noticed, of course, the vital signs dropped. But the easy didn't drop to the bottom, didn't go all the way to the bottom. When they put infrared light near it, the exclusion zone water peaked. It went all the way back up again. And then it was able to very slowly, over the course of about an hour, come back to some kind of a lower level. So he said, you know, we may even need to consider when somebody dies, when somebody's actually gone. And because even after the heart stops beating, there's still some brain, I wouldn't say activity, but some some brain kind of um uh uh, actually, I will, I'll just say kind of activity. If you there's some charge, some electrical charge still there for 10, 10 minutes or so after the heart stops beating. Anything that is, and also we are kind of piezoelectricity because we are an ocean, we're not distilled water. So anything moving is creating some kind of um, charge. So as long as there's something there, I think that the spirit can come back into using the, the, this kind of electrical track and come back into the physical body. Um, once it's gone, then I think it becomes uh, something, uh, another another stage. Um, I, I do think that there is a lot we don't know, but I have studied a lot of what people believe, a lot of different philosophies, religions, over my many years, and you always hear the same thing. You know, the spirit leaves the body upon death. Well, then how? How does it do that? So when you kind of consider even um, the this concepts of this mist or this veil, you know, everything's beyond the veil. So the veil's very thin, you hear that a lot. Or, you know, misty mists is a kind of like aspect of water. People have this idea of of, of a vapor and 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 you know, people that are like in spirit or ghosts, if you will. And there is kind of like in between stages, it kind of looks like a vapor. People have talked about things. So, so you talk to some people that sit with people as they're passing away, um, particularly um, within, say, the, the Buddhist beliefs. And I've heard some people say that they literally see that it looks like a vapor leaving the person. So I think that science will one day be able to kind of start perhaps looking into these phenomena and seeing, yes, I think that there are certain animals can, that can see these things. I think that certain uh, that the dogs, for example, you see a dog, often it's looking at things and you just wonder what it's looking at. Even babies, little babies, their fontanelle is still open. They're very still connected to another world and they can see things. I remember my, um, my son, Sashin, when he was just really, really young, and uh, you have the little thing to hear if they need you, you know, that, that intercom thing. Yep. And I heard him kind of, uh, I don't know, about two in the morning, kind of making some little gurgly noises and stuff. And I'm like, oh, he's awake. So I went in to see him. And like the, the windows were closed and everything. And his little mobile was moving above his head. He couldn't reach it. And it wasn't electrical. And I'm like, Ooh, that's unusual but he was just playing and like laughing and he just like acting like he was interacting with somebody and I and I do think that that little children are able to see things that that just that perception shifts as we get older it's not to say that we can't open it again so mm. I, I do think that um that that you know within that area there is a lot to be discovered and inquired about it makes some logical sense how, I mean, I have, I've seen a lot of people kind of um, looking into these things, but not a lot of people going, telling me how, well, what is the spirit? And we think it's this, uh, this invisible thing that somehow we're attached to, but maybe it has a lot more to do with water than we've imagined before. Yeah. Your, your work has made me wonder whether water is sort of the conduit through which consciousness 
emerges, I suppose. Uh, like without water, that consciousness can't emerge. And, you know, it's it's an interesting idea. And, you know, there are a lot of people in the mainstream out there who are very quick to criticize the work of guys like Jerry. Um, and like you said, you know, we don't know where water came from. Um, the current model, the cu current model that explains water has um, 75 or so anomalies that cannot be explained with the current model, yet they're so quick to say, oh, all of this fourth phase stuff is rubbish. Um, you know, it's it's very interesting to see, you know, both of those things happening at the same time where we don't really know what water is. We don't have a single grasp on what consciousness is, yet, you know, the, the desire for people in the mainstream to... Um, call these out as, you know, hocus pocus, um, is so large. So it is very interesting. And I guess one, one of the things that I wanted to ask a little while back is, you know, when you're, when you're getting these, um, these messages, I suppose, from water and it's very consistent and you can do it over and over and over, do you think water is agnostic to whether you, um, perceive it or not? Is, is does it want you to sort of know that it's there and it can hear you? Well, I guess coming from a, a perspective that this is a relationship, and and I think you know one of the things about me is that I'm not a scientist, so I'm not coming from any mainstream media scientist perspective. Although I do honor this, I, and I do think honestly that there are many scientists out there doing amazing work, and they. They, and they are very well qualified, but you are never going to make everybody happy. There is always going to be somebody that's going to call you a pseudoscientist if you're working in the realms yep. of, it seems, anyway, from what I've seen thus far. Yep. No matter how qualified you might be, you're never going to please everybody. But from my perspective, water, uh, I, this is about relationship. The only thing that's different about me uh, working in with water as what we know water to be um, is the fact that it's not in a physical body. That's the only difference. Otherwise, it would be me and you having a conversation because that's what we're doing. You and I are bodies of water actually having a conversation. We're in relationship at the moment by having conversations. And, you know, we form relationships with people in many different types of relationships um, quite easily. We know how to do that. Parent, child, you know, teacher, student, lover, beloved, all of these things. We know very well how to have relationships but then how do we know that um, water is not the emotion that flows through us? Hmm. It, it's an interesting idea. So how do we know it's not? How is that not, you know, it, it's like there's a lot of things that we, that people would say, well, that's preposterous because then it's just this chemical firing here and this and this and this, of course. But the ancient, I believe that anything, and this is just my personal belief, anything that is really true, anything that is true, you'll see an overlay of science, art, and indigenous wisdom. And they will actually make sense. They will be a beautiful overlay of them. And when we get very attached to, to an, an idea and then it's it's challenged. Um, that also challenges some of our kind of um, um, ideas about life. And, and we we like to feel it's surprising how we like to feel so safe in the world. Um, you know, having having an idea of how things work, there is a safety within that as human beings. It's like yeah. okay. Well, I know that, you know, if this happen, do this, then this is going to happen and this and this and this. When something starts doing something random or seemingly like magical or, or some phenomena is going on, often and not always because some people love that, uh, but often people feel very uncomfortable about it and they and, and this has happened in ancient old times and not that long ago, unfortunately, where people that had certain gifts were called witches. Yeah. You know, to be called a witch was actually, you know, you could be a midwife. You could, you're, 
your milk could curdle in your house and that made your witch. I mean, it is insane, but you could just have certain gifts of healing and you were a witch. So we have like people in certain areas of the world at certain timelines and time frames have not felt comfortable with things outside of what they have been told are right and good. So it's very interesting how we've become quite attached to, to our safety world. But actually, I think when you're studying water, you're really studying your own potential. And by you saying and suggesting, well, do you think that water is aware and wants you to be aware of it? Of course, it's just like anybody wants you to be aware of them. The last thing we want to be is completely ignored. Um, we want to feel seen and we want to feel heard. We want to contribute. Uh, why would water not want to do any of those things? It's in every single life form on earth. Yeah. It's what we look for when we're looking for life in outer space. The fact that I, I've often said that I believe that water is always in search of itself. And that someone once said, what if um, water is expressing its consciousness through us and every living thing on this planet to observe itself from every perceivable and imperceivable perspective? And my friend Moses Hackman says that water is the glove on the hand of consciousness. And I think that's very beautiful. So I I have a lot of thoughts, as I as as you may can probably tell. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's one of the things that I found is that there is a relationship, and it's because of the relationship that this works. This doesn't work if there is no liking or no openness from from the person doing the work so if you consider okay when you're going to start doing this work even if you're very skeptical just be curious is a great mm. place to start try not to shut off your your heart to it um and i would say that also you want to see imagine this is a relationship that is just beginning to bloom it's the you're just interested stage you think that they're really someone is really attractive and you're like we've asked them out you both like each other you want to go out you're going out for dinner and everything and 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 there's a lot of focus on that person if you go out and you're in a restaurant and there's lots of people everywhere for example the waiter comes you order the food but your focus is in wanting to get to know that person looking at their facial expressions and features, like imagining, you know, more about them, what, all this kind of thing. Well, in that particular space of in a healthy relationship, you're not wanting to control them or experiment on them or pick their entire world apart so you can put it back together the way you like it. That's not a nice relationship. So within this realm, I always say keep an open mind and invite water to share what it wants. The less I um, try, if you will, yeah, the, the more it works. So it, it's almost like the opposite of the science realm where they want everything to be a certain way and this repeatable here and here and here. The fact that water repeats and that I've seen that it do that does this, and I have this idea of 50 times, that's kind of my number. But once I've reached that 50 times and I try to keep going, it's almost like water's like, have you not got it already? <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> 50, like, let's do something new here. So, um, and and then you start looking for the layers of meaning and that's a whole other thing. But it takes such a long time. And I remember I have a small team of people working around the world with me on this project. And this guy in India, he, he was saying, and I think it's coming from his own feeling, um, you know, he said, well, God, water just must get so bored just just using the same thing over and over again. Here we go. Here's the word for this again. And, and I actually think, you know, the job of a teacher is to be very patient and to go over and over. It's like learning music. You know, your teacher just can't say, well, haven't you got it yet? You know, you come on. And so once you finally got there, then you can kind of move on. And it feels very much like that. So with the hydroglyphs specifically, art is just water having fun. Water is the ultimate architect. I mean, it designs everything we see. You know, it's the difference between plums and prunes, for example. It's, it's still a plum, 
but looks really different when there's less water in it. As we start to age, we look different from when we were babies. There's, you know, less water within us. Mm -hmm. There's, there's shape and form. It, it's, it's water is part of all of these things. There's even water, tiny amounts of water um, in stone. It's just as a really interesting side note, I was speaking the other day to a guy called Gary Cook, who's pretty well known in New Zealand. And he has this um, device that he is able to put near plants and he it detects a kind of song from the plants at certain sounds that sound like a song. So he put um, he put some of this this device in water, not really knowing if water would have these frequencies and sounds, but it played this beautiful song. And he started to share the story with me about the New Zealand kauri tree, which is a native New Zealand tree. Um, and we have one huge one. It's got a name. He's called Tane Mahuta. And he you can fit something like eight adults with their arms all the way around him. Wow. And so he says that that the kauri tree, um, especially in, in, in the Maori oral history, uh, communicated with the whales. And there was a certain type of whale that came um, through past New Zealand and New Zealand waters. And when they sing, he said, the song wouldn't just be heard in the sea. The song would actually create sound waves that came up and over the beach and into the stones and into the trees. And he said that the kauri tree would respond back with a type of frequency and they would talk, they'd have conversations. So he's taken the sound, the song of the kauri tree and he's going out on a boat to put the sound, that song into the ocean to see if it, the whales come, which I think is incredibly beautiful. Yeah, that's fascinating. And and it kind of makes sense because sound waves do travel through, um, you know, earth. They can travel quite quite a distance, particularly at the amplitudes that whales, um, whales can produce them at. So um, yeah. that's a, I mean, my tendency nowadays is to just, kind of believe what ancient ancient cultures had come up with um, because more and more we're kind of seeing that they were right about the things that they believed. Um, so, and and what you were saying before kind of makes me think that this is, this is potentially a little bit more difficult to sort of get across to people because if you don't open yourself up to the possibility, then you're your pessimism is probably going to affect the way that you would be able to do this crystal crystal crystallographic method. So I have had a big variety of people do this now. I've been sharing the technique for well over a year. Um, and you'll three you'll see one of those three patterns. You'll mm -hmm. see either a signature, but even if you're a skeptic, you'll see either a signature pattern, the an artistic impression, or a hydroglyph, at yeah. least one hydroglyph. So you'll see one of those three. So it's not that you won't see. Uh, and I think that sometimes, um, you know, children just are so wonderful at this because they don't really think about all the hows and whys. They just mm. have fun. So um, more than ever now, I share pictures that other people have done that are, that I'm sharing. And I think that there's... I think we currently have somewhere in the region of just under a thousand people on my private Facebook group for people that are actively doing this work. Mm -hmm. And I, one of the reasons I keep it specific to people who are only using the technique, it's like a giant test study to see yeah. what other people get, you know, what, what, what designs they have and what successes they have so far as, um, whether they are seeing what they're seeing using different influences. Um, and certainly some people have more success than others, but everybody sees one of those three patterns. So there, I always have 21 people um, on my workshops and each, everybody, nearly everybody has a Petri dish and they go ahead, they do the crystallography and then I, we all look at their pictures. What's interesting is that for each masterclass, there tends to be a theme from, and there's a people from around the world all using different waters. There is a theme that passes through everybody's um, crystallography. A certain hydroglyph that keeps showing up, um, a certain image. It's it's very interesting how the collective works when you're when you're doing these. 
Um, and, you, and, and then people can see signature patterns as well. This person had filtered, filtered water. This person had filtered water. This person had filtered oil. There's the filter glyph. You know, the signature pattern of, of filtered water. Mm -hmm. and all these different things. And then when people start to see similarities, and then they've never met any of these people before, and we're all around the world, there is a different view that happens. So it isn't that you're completely, it, it may work for you if you're completely skeptical. Right. I, I don't know, but it helps at the least stay curious rather than skeptical. And I think that anyone that actually wants to see this work and takes that advice to heart, um, it's probably not that hard to just be curious Yeah. Um, and see what happens. You know, it, it's simple, yep. easy, cheap and fun. So. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of sharing some images, um, I would love to sort of go through a few of yours just so people, if they're watching, they can sort of get an idea of, of what it is that you do and and maybe get a little bit of background about what the influence was that, um, you know, precipitated the the crystals forming. So um, let nice me know. Nice words, <laughs> precipitated. Okay. Well, these are, I want to show some of Laurent's work because I, I, I talked about it and a lot of people haven't seen his work. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a moto here. This is Laurent. So you can see his happy faces here, hearts, and this is all microscopic, not macroscopic. Right. So this is kind of fun to be able to just see, go, oh, okay, right, that's pretty cool. Um, so let me see what we've got here. So this is the first photo I ever took that I talked about of mm -hmm. my hand. So um, you can see why I was like, you know, oh, my God, it looks just like a hand. And you can see the size of the dish there as well. And you can see basically it took up half that dish. So it's quite large. Now, um, some of my images are, are that big. Some of them are smaller. They vary. So um, so this was the fish that I got in seawater. It's feathery and different because it's seawater and it was frozen solid. But you can see the outline of the fish, the tail the uh, fins, the gill, the eye. Yeah. Um, and then, oops, what are you doing? Are you do okay. Um, and this is the difference between my old technique and my new technique. I think it's really helpful to see the clarity of it. Yeah, now it's kind of like a, a low resolution versus high resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you'll see in my work that there's a lot of light that comes through. And that is, mm -hmm. and I love to play with the colors in the background. So you see different colors because of that. I'm artistic, I can't help it. But some people can set it up more scientifically and have done. Um, so it's up to them. Now, I will also show you those um, three levels of um, freezing after this in that video. But these are some examples of uh, facial recognition. So I've used photos as the influence. And the first time it happened was this. And I thought, well, maybe it was, <laughs> but that's it. I don't think you could say it's random, but um, I used my friend Wendy's photo and put my Petri dish of water on top of her photo and used my technique. And you can see her imprint is there. Um, somebody asked me to use Sadhguru's photo, which you can see is there. And you can also see that this is the side of the dish. So you can see this one's pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now this was over frozen, but uh, I've always been interested in Greek and Roman um, history. So this is Jupiter, otherwise known as Zeus. And you can see his beard, his mouth, his eyes, and all the stuff is there, but I just over frozen it a little bit too much. That is quite beautiful. I have, I don't think I've seen that one before, but that's very interesting. It's not, not the same as the other ones that you've shown. Yeah. It's nice to see the stages as well that I've yeah. got my own progression. Um, I like, I used a Roman coin and, uh, you can see this is more, I think I did this last year. Um, but you can see it's, it's, a, it's a lot clear, clearer than the other one. Um, I would say that art is the heart of water. So these are just some examples of my work. Um, this is an interesting one over here because I asked a woman who was pregnant to take a sip of water, leave me some think about her baby whilst she was drinking the water. And you can see I've outlined the baby and the baby looks light as well, which is really neat. Uh, below it is uh, um, an image, which looks very much like a etching 
So mm -hmm. this um, there was a cafe I was at, and I saw this this schnauzer dog drinking from the dog bowl of water that they'd left out for thirsty dogs. And I asked the lady at the cafe if I could have a takeaway cup <laughs> for the dog bowl water. She, I explained what I was doing, but I think she still thought I was nuts. But it was worth it because the picture was phenomenal. When I came home, I poured it into the dish and froze it. Um, there's there's stories behind them all, but just to kind of like move on, um, this is an interesting one where I put my thumb into the dish of water. You can see though that there is a chip at the end of my nail or of the nail here yep, in the ice yep. picture. But uh, three hours later, I chipped my thumbnail in exactly the same place, which was kind of interesting. <laughs> this one here is actually when I was cutting onions and I was crying and I scooped some of the tears into a, one of my Petri dishes of water, which is nearly always, I can see two of them on the, the um, bench top up there at the moment. So uh, I froze them, so it froze into the shape of an iris. I've done tests with tears, different emotions, um, and so uh, kind of chemical tears, which are produced from onions, for example, tend to form the shape from of the iris, whereas emotional tears tend to form different patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and um, here's just some more. I mean, there are thousands. It's just this is just like a little handful, and I share daily on Instagram and Facebook. Um, okay. For people who are just listening, um, all of these images of various animals and and plants and and um, objects, their resemblance is uncanny. Uh, it's it would be very difficult to explain this away as just a coincidence. I mean, perhaps if it was just one, yes, that's a coincidence. Ten, maybe a coincidence, but over a thousand, we really need to start asking questions about what's going on here because, as far as I'm aware nothing in the conventional model would would even remotely explain how this is going on you know how how water is picking up on these influences of images or thoughts and and um making its own interpretation as it as it freezes so um yeah this is a lot of these i haven't seen uh, a lot of these aren't in the book um so yeah this is fascinating yeah um and my children have been a big part of this. So some of those pictures they had taken themselves and, and used and influenced. Um, the Batman one was when my son was watching Batman put a petri dish of water beside him on the couch and they watched it together. Crazy <laughs> as that might sound, but it definitely looked like Batman. So what is energetic state of health is actually what we're observing here. Um, there's reasons I say that, which I think... Um, I think is explained um, here. So, for example, this is the signature pattern of tap water. Now, this is the same tap water after I've held it next to my heart for one minute and taken the crystallography. So what I've done is let that melt after freezing it and then did that. So it is actually the same water. Same water. Wow. So I think that that is a really important piece. That I often forget to share, share for some reason, but I think it, it, it says a lot. Um, now, you, you sometimes get from very pristine water, the whole, the whole dish takes up, um, is a giant hexagon shape. Um, and the larger, the better when it comes to the energetic state of water, the energetic health of water. Now, I say that because tap water for example, can clearly change uh, its structure with influences like um, vortexing, like being played in a singing bowl, like yep. being, um, you know, held, if you will. But it doesn't change chemically. Mm -hmm. So how come it's changing structurally? So that's a really important piece of which I think is very much suggesting that there is an energetic state of health. It's like an emotion that we're witnessing, an improvement. And it's very, very real and relative to, to actually see and watch. And I've done this so many times. Um, so let me just see. And this is just another example of a giant hexagon that my yeah. sister took uh, down the South Island for out of a bath outside. And it's about three feet um, in diameter so it's, it's actually really massive 
So nature likes to make these patterns. So um, with this example, it's just taking water from directly from the mouth of the, the um, source and then tracking it over a period of time and seeing that the hexagon tends to change, shift. It will often evolve into something else, interestingly. Um, but over here, you can see the work of Theodore Schwenk, who used the water drop method. So essentially, a drop is photographed as it's splashing, and the splash, depending on how it splashes, will indicate a kind of energetic health. So I'm seeing some similar things going on. This is from sort the source of spring water, further away, further away still. Um, and then... Oh, this is the album. And so I'll just stop that and go into the next one. I think there are some others. I wanted to share this. Now, this is hopefully um, we can get past all of these. Can you see the um, the round circle? Yes. Good. Okay. So what we're going to see here is the three stages of water as it freezes mm -hmm. um, this has been sped up otherwise we'd be here for ages <laughs> so the first stage i'm going to stop at so as we watch it this is starting to form okay stop it here this is the first freezing state this is the stage that i take all my photos at you can see there's yep. a lot of clarity a lot of imagery what you're going to see happen next is two things happening simultaneously there are two other freezers there is um one that comes on and kind of washes this all away that's uh, the second freeze the third freeze is actually in between two layers and it comes down from the top and is kind of darker and bubbly and that kind of basically clouds this whole whole thing over so as we start to watch you start to watch here's the washing and from the top you see the dark bubbles coming down now it's a very interesting because between the two layers of ice there is this liquid that starts to harden mm -hmm. and those are actually the bubbles so what we're seeing is this a complete wash over of the original first design so this is why my technique is so important because you really get to see the clarity when you compare that to say over here yeah there's a significant difference yeah so i think that that's a very very helpful video for people to go okay i, I understand why she does it this way now and not the other way yeah. and you can see the differences between the techniques in the pictures even though the pictures are still pretty interesting when you look at them from the um from the very very early days so yeah i i do think that knowing how to what you're looking for is important we've even had now um a phenomenal uh thing happen which i'm sharing um in the masterclass for for people in america it's on sunday this coming up for you it's on monday mm -hmm. but i have john and uh, john's been working with me doing this technique he was on one of my very first master um beginners workshop sorry and he's just about as prolific as me he takes photos every single day um and using this technique but he's able to do it outside he's not freezing anything in the freezer he's using nature's outdoor freezer because he lives in utah and um and he's just does this so much in winter and um he, i think he went through a slight depression when it was summer over there because he can't <laughs> Anyway, what's so interesting is that because he's able to do that and we see the, the the hydroglyphs in his work, we can safely say it's not from the freezers blowing a certain type of air or anything right. like that. It, it basically takes that out of the equation. Now, what's curious about that is I've done a big study on egg albumin, as you, mm. you, you know, I'm sure. Uh, I've observed that there are six specific patterns um, in egg albumin that um, occur in fresh free range happy hen eggs only two of those patterns occur in caged hen eggs as, as i know you know yeah. um, and anyone can you know go through my instagram and, and see the the study that i've shared however um so he he started freezing egg albumin outside and um so rather than it just being freezing in the freezer where we mm -hmm. can't see what's going on he's watching it 
But what's so interesting about what he's doing is he gets the, and he he raises his own ducks and his own chickens. So there is a relationship that he has with them. So he's watching this freeze. And what's interesting about John is that John has, has a signature pattern that I've become very aware of. And his signature pattern is what I would call the creation glyph. It is a known glyph that means creation. It, that, that layer of that meaning is also fire. Now, what's curious is that, I don't know, it must be about 50, 60 times he's got the creation glyph. And so it's he said to me, why do I keep seeing it? And I said, well, you know, you are a biodynamic farmer. You're planting seeds in the ground all the time. You know, you're, you're creating. And so the creation glyph is somewhat symbolic of you. And so, um, so with egg white, and I have done thousands of studies using egg albumin. So egg albumin is, is egg white, but not just, I don't just crack the egg, get the yolk out and shove the like egg white in there. I started doing that in the beginning until I realized that there's two types of egg white, just like there's kind of two types of water that I talked about. There is the gloopy gelatinous part of the egg white. Um, I put that aside. It's the thinner, more saliva-like egg white that I use. And anyone can do it. You just freeze it. It doesn't require um, conscious expression. You just freeze it for about eight to 10 minutes and then you pull it out and you see the patterns it's a great way to know if your eggs are fresh because it's a very indicative you can always tell so um so what was happening is that he started to see the normal beautiful patterns you see with happy free-range eggs you know starting to form and he filmed it which was really cool on, unto itself but then he would let the albumin dethaw, and then he kept using it for like i don't know over a week and what was so interesting is that unlike what I would imagine would have happened was that it started to form less structured ordered patterns. Um, it kept showing the normal patterns. And then all of a sudden when he was the most kind of just in love with doing this work and, and really just enamored with the, this, the, the, this, the kind of design of it, it started to form the creation glyph, and it, which he's captured on camera of egg albumin, which is a biological fluid doing something that it shouldn't do. And this is fascinating because it's almost as if, if you look at the albumin as kind of like an amniotic fluid, right? And mm -hmm. I've always thought that um, ancestral information can be shared through the amniotic fluid. Um, it's almost, and these, as if the egg albumin has um, is absorbing um, the information of John as the ancestor and is actually kind of uh, communicating as saying, we see you, we're adding you into the new formations for this chick that could be the, or the potential, I would say, of, of the chick, which is extraordinary because then it can go back to it doing its regular patterns again. So when you see that and you hear him talking about it and his relationship that he has with the water and the um, birds, it's, it, it's kind of very reminiscent of a study that Rudolf Sheldrake talks about. He didn't do it, but about this, this setup that this guy did, um, I can't remember what year they did it in, uh, with chickens, little baby chickens and a robot. There was this little robot and... Um, the robot was set up to basically draw random pictures, like just draw random things. And he just moved around this piece of paper and he drew all these random pictures. Um, but then they set it up. And so when a chick comes out of an egg, it attaches itself emotionally to the first person or thing that it sees. And so this um, little robot was there and the chicks fell in love with it and just thought it was their mum and they it became emotionally bonded to it and so what was interesting is that the robot had a, a piece of paper and so wherever the chicks were they and the chicks were placed in a certain area the robot would only design in the area of the page where the chicks were and left the whole area that it was doing originally um, completely empty and, and only designed near where the chicks were and so it, it, it's interesting how their consciousness appeared to have affected even machinery, this, this robot. 
to to so so when we start seeing that and um i watched a, a rupert give a talk the other day um in a podcast and he was sharing about how some people just um don't do well with uh technology and uh there were um offices where like in an office space where the 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 photocopier or something or something around the computers you know some person would come in and suddenly it would like nothing worked properly or never worked for them as soon as they left somehow it's miraculously fixed some people just have like an energy that somehow affects technology my mum for example must have had a high electrical charge somewhat like I did she used to work at a company called Raycon Industries this is before she passed she worked there for 20 years and they Work, made quartz crystals for satellites and com, um, various radios and things like that. And um, she would go past the technology that was where you'd have the meter reading for frequency, and she'd just walk past and it would go halfway or all the way over. So she did, there was something about her that, you know, they had to get someone else to do those readings because she'd just walk past and there would be a strange reading that would happen. So, you know, if people can affect our conscious expression or our energy field can affect technology, there's not, you know, and, and, and chickens, little chickens can affect yeah. a robot. It's not so far-fetched to imagine that we can also um, have an impact on water. Yeah. And you went, you went to the, um, international water conference last year in October. Um, and what did you learn there? Because I know you, not only did you speak, but there were a lot of other speakers as well. And probably a lot of people there that you conversed with, um, you know, what, what did you take away from, from going to that conference? Yeah. One of the biggest, it's interesting. Um, I arrived, I was so exhausted because I, I had come from New Zealand. Um, and so, I, I arrived there and I caught the end of someone's talk and this, and I, and I've been talking about it cause I, I loved it. He was basically saying that animals are the organs of the forest. And he said, for example, that bird song, um, you know, how we have that beautiful chorus of birds singing in, in the early morning and sort of around sunset. He said, when they do that, it actually, the vibration of their song helps the trees to grow stronger and faster. And um, you think about the amount of cicadas, I, I suspect you have them in Australia as well, but they're, they're just so loud here. Yeah. You know, they're literally on the tree. You can imagine the vibration coming from the cicadas um, and, and you imagine what impact they're having on the trees. And so I, I found that really, really interesting. Um, also, I spoke to, uh, we, we actually interviewed a number of people when we were there because we were doing some stuff for a documentary. And what Jerry said was that, you know, when it came to my work, at least, he, he years ago, I, I went to go and uh, see him and I spent some time at his place in Seattle. And he projected the thought of a house into the water. And he was sharing with everybody that, you know, he got a house in the water. So it's not just me. <laughs> just me, yeah. you know, doing this. Um, but I spend a lot of my time at the water conference actually working on my presentation. Um, there is a number of reasons for that, but um, that was one of the takeaways I thought was really interesting. There were many. I mean, I, I already knew a lot of people's work that was that were presenting there anyway. But what I was saddened to hear was the amount of incredibly intelligent, respected, qualified people um that have just been given such an incredibly difficult time um being called pseudoscience or even things like there was a someone who's very 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 qualified phd physics blah 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 um working in homeopathy his home you know his, his lab might get shut down because homeopathy is almost something that's starting to look like it being banned in some places so it's it, it's interesting when you start talking to these people. But one of the big things that was shared at the conference was where are the young people? Who's taking this over? All these people have spent a huge part of their lives. Jerry's always saying, you know, everyone here, look, 
apart from a few people, we've all got white hair. <laughs> and, you know, where are the where are the young people? And so I I I um I think that one of the, the gifts I hope that I offer um is to bring some of their science into my everyday talks and to make it very easy for people to kind of get ideas about because some science can be very hard, especially quantum science and quantum physics. Um, I think you'll be very interested uh, once it's out there um, in that uh, uh, on my next upcoming masterclass, I've got a guy called Dave um, Rossi coming on. He's a young genius, really, when you talk to him. Um, it's in the realm of quantum physics. And he is... Um, helping me put together a paper, a scientific paper, uh, based on the phenomena that we see going on with my work and how it's possible, um, talking about um, all different kinds of very big quantum physics terms. But when you start breaking them down, you go, okay. And he's talking it very much in around the hydrogen state so um, and about the biofield impacting um uh, I'm trying to remember all the different um, terms that he use, used, but uh, also around zero point energy. So um, he has to really explain it to me as if he was explaining it to an eight year old, because if you can't explain it to an eight year old, you don't really know your stuff. Yeah. So he needs to refine and refine and refine so that I can also then explain it without needing to use all these giant terms, but making something very complex, very simple is hard. But you need to do it. It has to be done because if you want people to understand to some degree, you know, the everyday person is the kind of person that is quite likely to do this, to try this out because you you can do it in your kitchen. But then it's like being able to understand how it's happening. It, it's It's kind of a really lovely piece to have. It's an important piece to have. But I do think that the way this is happening, explained quantum through a quantum method, um, is actually the where it needs to go, because I think if we keep bringing it back to water memory and this idea of water memory and storing information, that's one thing. But I think there's a bigger dynamic that's actually happening here, and the bigger dynamic is the interrelationship between energy and the water's ability to pick up that information, but yeah. also then share information um, in its own way, in its own unique way, which which is where the, like I said earlier on, where the unseen becomes seen, where you start to see this, this kind of image appear. And then when you're looking at it, you have a different relationship. You actually form a relationship with things you see. Mm -hmm. and, and we understand that we understand that like uh, right now you you can't see or I'll, I'll use something you can see. I have these glasses that I that I need to use these days right and um and so I have a relationship with these glasses I look at these glasses I can see these glasses and I and I know what their purpose for me is the fact that I can see them means there's some relationship I have with them that we have relationships with the food we eat, we have relationships with the people we see, we have relationships with the things that we don't have any interaction with, but over all the way over there, I can see a mountain with trees on it. So I have a relationship purely by viewing it. The fact that I see it, I observe it, means there is some relationship that my observation of that mountain over there means that there is something happening. So the fact that we see the imagery, we absorb the imagery, I always say, if it's way too much over your head, rather than throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, and just make meaning that it has no value to it all, see this as art. Art will stand the test of time. Art is where you don't have to know everything. It is nice to know the story about the artist and why they did what they did. It kind of brings more value to the work. But mm -hmm. if you look at it as art and you think, wow, what does that mean to me? Like, how? wow, that's amazing. Then you get to appreciate it rather than just going, oh, it's baloney. See, I don't need people to know 
me as a sci in, a, in in the science world one way or another if they do then that's wonderful but mm -hmm. I, I am coming from a perspective that I've I found something discovered something I'm showing the work as it is how it works I'm still learning mm -hmm. I have theories clearly but but for me I, whether or not I know how it works is not going to stop me from doing the work and and so the in fact, the mystery, the magic of how it's how it how it develops and what I can learn, I think that's the place where the where it where it's it's very potent for me, is that I'm humbled and honored that people want to learn more and mm. that that incredibly intelligent people from all warps of life are coming, going, how can I help you with this? Because I'm presenting something. That, that that requires, I think, in the world that we live in, for all different types of people that we have that like to understand, that like to see, that like to feel, they want to know more because it's amazing. Mm. So it's really amazing. And it's amazing to me too. Every single day it's amazing. And have so... You, have you asked water a question? Lots of times. And I asked water what a hydroglyph was and it answered me in hydroglyphs. It used the message glyph and it used the living glyph which means living message. So um, I've asked water if it can connect to my mum. Mum died in 1999. She was like my best friend. And she was just like a, an earth angel for sure. And um, I used to live in Japan years and years ago. And before like emails and cell phones and stuff, I sound like an old relic, but <laughs> anyway. And um Mum would write letters to me and where I'd write letters back. I have like a handful of them uh, that I've kept. And at the end of every letter, mum would attempt to draw a circle and draw a little heart inside. And mum's circles were particularly not circle-like. And um, and so when I asked Water if it could connect to my mum, because um, she passed away in, in 99 with cancer, um, I got this incredible misshapen circle with a heart in the middle, just like mum used to draw. And uh, on her birthday each year, I, I asked the same question and see a, a misshapen circle with a heart in the middle. And, you know, I had no idea, on, in the very first one anyway, I had no idea that water would ever do this. I didn't know if it could, would anything would happen. I didn't know if, if, if what would I had no idea of an outcome is what I'm saying. It's like people might say, well, you know, maybe you were thinking of her face or you were thinking of this, but that happened so long ago that I never thought about the the letters. Um, people often ask me, you know, have you, have you asked about God and have you asked about this and that and the other? Um, on the masterclass, I'm sharing for the first time, the very first photo I ever took um, when using the word Yeshua and mm -hmm. also when using the word Magdalene. Um, I'm also sharing how water communicated through hydroglyphs after having been placed on a Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, um, and the Quran. And so um, it's very interesting how they vary slightly and what it shares. Uh, understanding about how hydroglyphs work, I think, helps us to piece together a language that is not designed to be spoken but really designed to be felt much like hieroglyphs mm -hmm. hieroglyphs are a picture language that were designed to be spoken and not to be spoken but to be felt and they 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 share concepts so we're seeing these kind of concepts but we get very sometimes stuck on a word remembering that what we're seeing in the ice is not a symbol for the word it is a symbol for the energy of the word. And, and that's different. That There's a difference in that. So, for example, this is a cup with a tea bag in it. This is a cup. The energy of a cup holds something different for me, says something different to me than just the cup. The cup is very right. That's a cup. It's a cup. Okay. But the energy of the cup is that. I hold it. It feels something. It's it's like either warm or it's cold. What is it made of? Like, what's the energy? How does it feel to me? You know, you're asking different questions. Yeah. 
it, it definitely opens you up to ask yourself different questions um, and how to understand them. Uh, like Jerry was saying, you know, Jerry always, he's a very practical man, very sciencey. I love Jerry. And he's like, you know, you've got to get to, you got to get past step one before you can get to step two. He said, and, and so the step one is just right, right. Let's see the repeatability. The step two is like more about what it means. I'm already at step three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let everybody kind of catch up and then we'll figure it out from there. And maybe I've made some leeway for us and it's mm. some leeway before I pass away in this, in this earthly realm, I, I hope to leave some, some, some pearls of wisdom, some drops of wisdom here and there. So <laughs> it's helpful for other people as they come through. Yeah, absolutely. And just sort of thinking about, um, you know, everything we've spoken about and, and really how important water is to life and really that water is life. You know, you can't, you know, biology doesn't work without water. And that I, I guess a lot of people will be wondering, well, we drink water every day. What, what, what type of water should we be drinking for, you know, for maximizing our health and vitality? Um, I know, this is a an open question still, um, but I'd love to get your opinion on, you know, what type of water should we be, you know, drinking throughout the day? Well, firstly, I'll say it's a very first world problem. Mm. The fact that we can ask what type of water we should be drinking rather than what water can we drink, I think we need to acknowledge that the relationship people that with that people have with water, where they have to walk so far away to get yeah. any kind of water, is way different than the relationship that we might have because we take it so much for granted. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, you know, there's a plethora of ideas and of different types of water that seem good for your health. But I think that, firstly, whatever water you manage to get in front of you, is the water to drink. Mm -hmm. You think about how it got there. If you think about how much water there is in the world and only one, like one, maybe 2% of that water is drinkable and that that water has managed to get in front of you <laughs> into your cup. It's come through the trees and the, 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 the clouds and the earth and the animals and the the ancestors and the dinosaurs or whatever. And it's so it's managed to get to you in the first place. I think the more we actually start to, to even acknowledge that is a really good place to uh, start because the way that your body receives the water you drink is based around how you perceive it. So it is not just about the quality of the water. Of course, if you want to talk that, I love going and collecting what would be called as wild water. I love spring water. It's kind of gone through the filtration system of the earth. When you go on a pilgrimage, even if it's just around the corner to get your spring water, then you have a former relationship that is entirely different than going to the supermarket and just picking something off the shelf that looks pretty good. Yeah. Um, so my preference is spring water. Eclected. Now, if you can't afford that, if you're going to buy something in the store, then I would recommend finding a spring water. If you can find a spring water that's in a um, colored glass bottle, ideally blue, but if green, that's okay. Water is especially spring water is very sensitive to artificial light. So any water that's in a clear bottle is allowing the artificial light to come in and it is uh, denaturing, or not denaturing, but definitely there's structure structural changes that start to lessen um, when it's exposed to that infrared light. I'm sorry, um, artificial light. Now, is, I, I think there's it's personal choice too. Your body craves certain waters at certain times as well. Like I've gone through a huge period of my life loving only spring water. But then I went through a little patch uh, period of time um, where I wanted to have rainwater and my body was wanting that. And so the more sensitive, the cleaner you eat to start with, the more you're going to be able to taste the differences in water and their texture, even then their flavor. People think, 
or water doesn't how does it have flavor minerals have flavor you can taste the minerals within them and so you should never be able to smell your water if it smells like chlorine don't drink it um if you can't get anything if you've got no money um to spend on going to the supermarket and buying stuff um then i i think you you know getting a good filter um on your tap water if that's all you can do that's what you can do then i mean then there's all the different things you can get where you can uh, vortex the water and use all there's so there's so many different types of restructuring devices out there but i would say if you're really interested go and see Isabel Friend's website. She's a friend of mine. She has everything you can imagine. Um, and she highly recommends um, a certain whole house system. She, she likes it very much and she explains exactly why. It's just not coming to me the name of it right in this very second, but I can share it with you later and you can maybe share a link or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it basically works just like a, um, a spring like spring water would in the filtration way. She, I'm not personally a fan of um, ionized water machines, Kangen and all that. It's not for me. I like what water does in its most natural way. Um, and actually, Isabel Friend has a wonderful uh, whole video about that. So, um, and I think that that's, that, and I'm just talking about my personal preference. So this isn't anything against, what anyone else likes um i i mean yeah you can, we can just kind of go on and on and on but i think the more, more importantly than all of those things is if you're fortunate enough to have a glass of water in front of you i think being grateful for the fact that it's there to be actually the welcoming committee i always say you're the welcoming committee for anything you put inside your body full stop and and so how how we welcome something if we even welcome it at all such a big part of our day-to-day -day life is just shoving food in our mouth and drinking without any thought about it unless you're actually step back and say well I'm grateful for this food because of blah 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 I'm grateful for this drink I'm grateful for this water uh, a lot of people don't do that so there is this kind of like just automatic pilot thing going on but if you welcome the water into your body realizing that it's going to become you that's kind of a big deal everything we eat and drink actually becomes part of us in this worldly realm um then how it responds to you you can be drinking the best water in the world for everybody says it can't beat this but how you receive it is how it's going to respond in your body. It's how it's going to hydrate you. It's how it's going to um, inspire you. If you are conscious and aware enough to actually be mindful that when you drink this, feel it going down your throat, feel it becoming part of you. Go, you know, say thank you. I'm so happy that you, you know, you're you're coming into this realm. The very first. Thing that water touches when you drink it is your saliva the first watery realm your saliva holds the um, impression of the very last thing you said so always be mindful if you can be on what the last word you said was before you drink water because that's the welcoming committee that's the i'm so happy you're here you know uh rather than just is there someone I don't even know, you know, somebody come in the door, you know, it, it is this, this kind of mindset, no pill, no medicine, no nothing that is given to you is healing your body. Your body is healing your body and your body is healing your body because of how you perceive yourself, how you perceive the world how you respond to frequencies, vibrations, to energies, and how you value yourself. And if we are, by molecular count, as we know, 99% water, and we are not valuing the water within us, then really, how are we going to be valuing not only the water that we drink or the food that we eat, but any other thing that exists in front of us? Mm. So I, I think this is just a, a small little suggestion anyway. 
Yeah, well, something that always, you know, since since I came across this uh, this realm of water, it's made me wonder, you know, well, if thoughts and um, you know words and sayings can have such a, a deep impact on the way that water, you know, structures itself when when it crystallizes, you know, where where mostly water, like what happens when someone says "I love you" to you and they really mean it, you know is that really changing the way that your body is operating? And I think it definitely is. Everyone knows they feel, you know, that tingly feeling when they're with someone that they really love and they know what it's like to, you know, feel like, feel the opposite of that. And it's, it changes, changes their, their body quite dramatically. Mm. Um, so it is, I think you gave the perfect answer there. Um, as far as what, what water is best to consume. I mean, it reminds me of that image you showed with the tap water and then you held it up to your heart and refroze it. You know, some it's the same water, I guess, but the influence that has been put upon it is different. And uh, it makes sense that uh, the intention with which you arrive to that water, the, the gratitude that you bring towards it is going to be one of the biggest determinants about, you know, how it reacts with your with what you are. And uh, yeah, it will turn into your blood, and and it's re- really weird to think that that will actually become part of you. But I yeah, I think that was the perfect answer um, because there is so much minutia. But at the end of the day, that is the that is the fundamental uh, key aspect of of what it is to drink good water. Well, I, I think also it's the fundamental key to to finding peace within self. You know, it's it's what we see in these little petri dishes is like reflections of ourselves all the time they're like little mini worlds and i think water is one of its greatest gifts is that it reflects us in the way it sees us yeah yeah and i think that water sees us in a much more profound way than we see ourselves Mm. um and that when we see that the most incredibly profound and beautiful patterns that it designs um you know it makes us kind of have a maybe just hopefully some uplifting feeling that not only is it that we are seeing water but the water seeing us and water is seeing us in a way of which maybe no one else in the world sees us and in a very spiritual way i would sort of suggest as well um so i think water's natural tendency is actually to upgrade things uh i saw i put two i took two um glasses of water one with tap water one with spring water freshly collected spring water and left them overnight the and i and i and i took the patterns i did the patterns prior these tap water looked like tap water the spring water looked like spring water and it had this beautiful kind of um lotus glyph in it which has the energy of the words um, purity and enlightenment when left beside each other <clears throat> overnight the tap water improved to look more like rainwater, which which i was not so surprised to see but even the spring water improved the spring water after i refroze it had both um two lotus glyphs that formed together to create the shape of a heart by being given purpose it increased its potential even more and when you apply all of the things i'm seeing in water to what it is to be a person Mm -hmm. you you can't unsee it (laughs) you just can't you can't go there has to be something here because what we're seeing is is emotional responses is upliftment is almost spiritual um like something from a spiritual teacher you would be taught and shown except that we're seeing it in our kitchen and and kids can 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 take this and teach us things from this i think the young people today um they're very wise and they they have it's nice to be offer a, a platform for them to um to play with this and to take this so much further than i am and that's the other thing i'm enjoying the most it's like the places people can take this is unlimited but also i think that um being able to just have children and inquire and play 
at a young age, you start, you, you know, all of my work has come from self-inquiry. It's like, well, what happens if I try this? Well, I wonder if this, you know, there's no rule book to any of it. But mm -hmm. I only would suggest that if you're really, really excited about one topic, one, whatever that topic is, maybe it's owls or something, and, and you just focus the, 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 the influence beyond this one thing, and you do that for the longest period of time you can, what you're going to see, and you'll be able to, 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 to um, see a lot of information. You'll see repeated patterns. You might see this, you might see that. But if you just do something for a short time, you're never going to know as much about it. The reason the ancients and the indigenous people knew so much about this, these ancient sciences, so to speak, is because they spent so long watching the environment. I read this book about this guy that wrote a whole book about one tree. He watched this one tree for 10 years took photos of it every day. Wow. He learned everything about the natural environment around the tree. He knew when there was something wrong with the tree because it did the bark went a different color. And he could tell why that was based on the certain insects that had come into the area. You know, you watch something long enough, you do something long enough, you really, really get to know about it. That's that's a fantastic um, observation as well. Um and I, I hope you continue to to do um, the work that you're doing and and continue to inspire uh, more people to uh, contribute to this um, this library of work that that you're compiling. Um, so I think that would be a great place to end it. I've taken up a lot of your time already. Um, you've got a masterclass coming up. Um, have you spoken enough about what you um, what's going to be new in that masterclass, or is there anything else you'd like to say about what's what you're going to be focusing on? Pretty much ninety nine percent percent of everything I'm sharing in the masterclass is new. Wow! So uh, for anyone that's already been, done my masterclass, you'll be surprised. But I am sharing some things about me that I've never shared before, talking about the time when I drowned and. Um, and I'm talking about some things that I, you know, that I'm quite feel kind of like, I guess, vulnerable about sharing uh, because um, I don't know, because they're a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But I do think that uh, the masterclass is for people that are already interested in uh, topics of sunken civilizations and right. um, anything relating to Lemuria and Atlantis and um uh, the, the Bermuda Triangle and my master classes are also very um, I have people coming from different perspectives so I have an archaeologist coming on who worked on the Bosnian pyramid um, he was the project manager there and he's sharing about what he discovered and a lot of his discoveries that uh, you might not hear from some archaeologists um, we have a quantum physicist coming on talking about how um, about propulsion, zero point energy, craft, all these kinds of things that are clearly a lot of people are interested in because this is triple the size of any masterclass I've ever done so far in the numbers of people that have signed up. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got Elizabeth B. Jenkins, who wrote the book called Return of the Inca, talking about her remarkable experiences, which I think that she's probably the most um, unknown about, I haven't promoted her a lot because when people actually hear her speak, they're going to really be surprised how amazing she is. Um, but also looking at things from an Indigenous um, perspective and the Incan perspective and how they use things called water mirrors to look at the stars and read the stars and um, egg divination that people might never have heard of. Um, some pretty interesting things. And to start the workshop off, I've got Kalani Souza, who is a brother from another mother. I just love him. He is an indigenous Hawaiian elder talking about the legends of the Pacific um, and, and also what evidence there is um, and the oral legends. And we're also talking about a lot of um, things around New Zealand and um, some uh a, a, a type of people called the Patupahiri, who were known as like the little people. Um, they were uh, kind of in the magical realm, but actually it seems that there is some physical evidence of their existence. So I have someone who wrote a book about that um, called Tom, um, who is talking about that and the effects that um, the moon and the sun 
have on water and the earthly realm, which he's one of the most clever people I've ever met in this in the science realm as well. So he is just phenomenal. Uh, so we have all of these amazing people and John sharing his pictures of album and changing and responding um, to him. So yeah, it's going to actually be about nine hours long. So there is a lot of topics and there's a lot of sharing and I don't want to rush through it all. I want everyone to be able to feel free to speak really, really in detail about what they know so that we get a hugely well-rounded amount of information. But for anyone that is interested in all of these kind of topics and crop circles as well, I have an expert coming to talk about them too. Um, you will hear about things you've never heard about. Um, I can guarantee it because some of the things I wrote myself whilst I was in a, a, a really unusual space for a year that um, it's it, the whole the whole thing is called the year I thought I was going crazy and um, quite quite an interesting share when I look back at what I've written uh, and how much in alignment it is to things that have been discovered. Um, it's really interesting. So yeah, that's a little bit about that. Awesome. I'm I'm going to put links to everything um, that we've spoken about today and, and links to your website where people sign up can sign up for the masterclass, um, not just this upcoming one, but the ones in the future as well. Um, I will encourage everyone to get the book that you've released that um, Don't has... encourage them because no one can get the book. I'd love people to be able to. Oh, really? Like last year, my, my publisher went bankrupt. So there they are. You have one of the few, you don't know how many people every day reach out, where can I get your book? Wow. And so that, that's probably super valuable now because there are only a thousand made and there are a lot of people looking for them. Wow. Okay. <laughs> just another one, one day um, with all new photos and stuff in it too, as well as the step-by-step -step guide I want to put in the back. But, um, but as of yet, I don't think anyone can get that book. <laughs> wow. Okay. I, I'm luckier than I, than I thought then I managed <laughs> to get my hands on an early copy. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking some time to speak with me. Um, I, I've learned so much and I, I really can't thank you enough for doing the work that you're doing. Uh, I think it really shows that anyone can uh, be a scientist, I suppose, and, and ask questions and observe nature and, and see, um, see what it uh, says back to us. So um, thank you so much for everything you're, that you're doing. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. No worries. I will, uh, I'll keep in touch. We'll talk soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to keep up with Vader's work, I've put some links in the episode notes. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can subscribe on Spotify and YouTube, and you can leave up to a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. This is a simple, no-cost way to support my work and help me reach more listeners. Please feel free to leave any comments on my YouTube channel as I do read through as many as I can. I've also put links to all of my social media platforms and my website in the episode notes if you'd like updates on the podcast, information about health, or you'd just like to reach out to me. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Take care.